This is the seventh installment of the Crash Course Regions Chemistry Series. And in this installment, we'll be going over all of the pertinent acid and base type of information you need to know for the New York State Regions. Here we go. Okay. Well, it all begins with what water does to itself. Okay, water loves to self-ionize. So we can uh, draw this two ways. Water, okay, in equilibrium with itself, okay, will break apart into a proton and a hydroxide. This is called an auto-ionization reaction. Not something you have to know exactly, but the principles based on this are something you have to know. Now, we can also write another way. We can have another water in contact with another water. And this also would form an equilibrium of a something called a hydronium ion, H3O+, and a hydroxide. And I want you to understand is that the H+, sometimes called a proton, or the H3O+, the hydronium ion, are synonymous. Okay, Whether you have a water holding on to a proton or just a proton itself. Now, of course, H+, is a proton because if you notice, H11 has zero neutrons when you subtract one proton, right? That's a one proton and one electron if it's an atom because they have to be neutral so the protons equal electrons. Well, if it loses an electron, you're just left with a proton. So that's why H plus is called protons. Now, table O and table E will talk about these values. Let's go there now. And there's table E listing a proton, mass of one, charge of one. And that's it. Table E shows the hydronium ion, H3O+, the water holding on to an H plus of proton. And, of course, we have our hydroxide somewhere. And I will find it. There it is, hydroxide. So do not confuse hydroxide with hydronium. Sound very similar, but you need to know the difference. This is responsible for what acids do to the solution of water, and this is due to bases. We'll get to that in a second. Okay, so as I alluded to already, Acids will increase this concentration. So it'll make water, okay, in an aqueous solution have more H pluses, protons, or hydroniums. And bases will somehow increase the hydroxide concentration, okay, in water. Okay, and it's very important to know the balance of the hydroxides to these ions here because it affects many, many types of reactions. All organic type of reactions, living reactions, have a delicate balance of acidity or basicity, this ratio here. So we need to be a cognizant of that. So that's why pH is important. Now, what you have to know from pH is not exactly what I'm going to show you here, because I need to show you some things that are beyond the scope of the course to explain why. For instance, we know acidity is based on this concentration, whether you call it a proton or a water. So what we do is we know that at equilibrium, okay, water breaks apart into these ions. And we have something called an equilibrium constant, not part of the course, but something I think is important to understand. So an equilibrium constant is going to be the concentration of the products. So I'm going to write H plus synonymous with H3O plus. I'm writing it this way to remember that I can be talking about a proton concentration or H3O plus times the hydroxide concentration gives me some value that's always constant. So at equilibrium, we do know this. We know that the concentrations of ions stay constant from our equilibrium unit because the rate of the forward equals the rate of the reverse. So therefore, these guys have to be constant. Now, of course, it's temperature dependent, but again, that's not going to be part of this course. We know that this value of the concentrations is going to equal 1 times 10 to the negative 14. Again, not part of the course, but it's important to understand the concept that these stay constant at equilibrium. Now, these ratios can swing. So the product of these guys will stay constant, but how much of each depends on each other. For instance, we should firstly know that pH is called the negative log of the H plus or the H3O plus concentration. Now, negative log is a fancy way of saying, hey, take the positive value of our exponent, okay? And we can do that because of ones in front. So before we get there, I'm getting ahead of myself, let's put a value in. 
So if I know that for every one water, there's one H plus and one hydroxide, then I know these two values have to be constant. So 1 times 10 to the negative 7 times 1 times 10 to the negative 7 gives me 1 times 10 negative 14. Okay, why am I doing that? Well, 7, a negative 7 plus a negative 7 equals 10 to the negative 14. If you remember your math with exponents, when you multiply exponents, you add them. And why I made these numbers the same is because one water breaks apart into one of these. Okay? Now, if I do the pH, and the pH means negative log, but all it means is take this whole number and stuff it into an exponent, because the entire course will always have a 1 in front, you can take this negative 7 and just make it 7. So take the positive value of the H plus or the H3O plus concentration. Now, if there was a number in front, we would need to calculate and do negative log to do that. But in this course, they'll always have a 1 in front. Okay, so the pH is 7. Now, what does that tell us, party people? pH is 7 tells us that, well, the H plus or the H3O plus, remember, it's synonymous, is equal to the hydroxide. So if you don't have, if you don't have anything acidic or basic in the water, you've got pure water, the pH has to be 7, and we call that a neutral pH. Why? because these guys are equal. There's nothing influencing, okay, this ratio, one to one ratio. Now, if I was to add, let's say I add an acid, okay, that means I'm going to increase this concentration. So let's do that. So now I'm going to increase this concentration to one times ten to the negative uh, let's just keep it like this. Let's keep these values here. This was 1 times 10 to the negative 7, and this was 1 times 10 to the negative 7, and of course to equal that. So now I'm going to add something acidic. I'm going to change my arrow, and I'm going to pull that below here. Okay. Now I'm going to increase the H plus. Don't lose sight that this value is the concentration of these guys. Okay, so I'm going to increase the H plus, the proton, or the hydronium concentration 100 times. And this becomes 1 times 10 to the negative 5. Look at that. This number is 100 times bigger. Now, you don't have to know all the details of these numbers here, my friends, but what you do have to know is this right here, that a pH scale differs tenfold with each pH number. Let me explain. Remember, the pH is the positive value of the what? Now the pH here was 7. Okay, well, if I increase the acidity 100 times, the number gets bigger. That's right, the negative, 1 times 10, negative 7 goes to 1 times 10, negative 5. It got bigger by 100 times. And because they always have to equal this number multiplied together, what's a negative 5 plus what number is negative 14? And you guessed it, 1 times 10 to negative 9, right? 9 plus 5 equals that. The, the uh, product of these two values has to always equal that value. Okay, so you noticed this increased 100 times. This decreased or it changed 1 over 100. Notice the number got smaller. And for those having trouble with that, okay, this is point zero 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 one two three four five six one. That's what this number here is, and this number is point zero 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 one. Notice that number is bigger by two decimal places. Each decimal place is a ten. Okay, so the pH scale is a logarithmic base ten scale. All right, so clearly this number is bigger. Now the pH, as we just talked about, is the negative log of this concentration or the positive value of this exponent. So the pH is 5. Wow. Okay. Now pH of 5, which number is bigger? And by a very long shot, you can clearly see that the H plus, remember it's the same thing here, or the H3O plus is much bigger. So we would say the H plus or the H3O plus is greater than the hydroxide. And my friends in chemistry, this is the acidic scale. 
Anything lower than 5 is acidic because this number is bigger. Now, do you have to know these numbers? No. Do you have to know that pH below 7 is acidic? Yes. Do you have to know that the difference in the hydronium concentration or the proton concentration compared to the hydroxide when the pH changes from 7 to 5 increased 100 times? Yes. So I'm showing you what you need to know to understand this. So if the pH went from 5 to a pH of 2, how much more acidic is it? Well, you can clearly see that this changed by a, an integer of 3. And because a pH is really the exponent, base 10, the 3 is really three zeros. So a pH of 2 is a 1,000 times more acidic than a pH of 5 because the 1,000 is equal to 10 to the 3. These pH numbers are really exponents. Just if I said the opposite, if the pH went from 5 to 7, the H plus or H3O plus decreased 100 times. And decreasing 100 times, we would say it changed 1 over 100. Or you could say the basicity or the hydroxide concentration increased 100 times. Very important you get that. All right. Now, if you don't see that, let's change. Um, let's go with another value. Let's uh, do a, ba a basic. Let's add a base to this system here. So if I add a base, okay, this starts out neutral, but this number got bigger by 100 times. 1 times 10 to negative 5. Whoa. This means that 5 plus what is 14? The product of these values has to equal negative 14. And you guessed it, 1 times 10 to the negative 9. Now, the pH, I can't say enough, is always about the H plus ion concentration, never about the hydroxide. That'd be a pOH. So this is a pH of 9. And guess what? Who's bigger? Yes, the H plus, H3O plus, is less than the hydroxide. And this, of course, is a basic range. Okay, so when you add a base, it increases the hydroxide concentration and your pH rises because this number has to get smaller as this number gets bigger. And a smaller number is a higher exponent. If you don't like any of that, you just got to know anything above 7 is a basic pH, more hydroxides. Anything less than 7, you have to have a bigger number for the H pluses or H3O pluses. And that's important to know. Okay, so acids and bases affect the pH accordingly. And you have to know who are your acids and bases, so let's go to your definitions. We have the Arrhenius definition. And so Arrhenius, or the Arrhenius definition, I think the H is silent, okay, is the most simplistic of all definitions. It's the name you have to know. People panic when they see a name. What did you do? Oh my gosh. Think of it as the easiest definition. So if you're an acid, we know the pH, of course, drops, and there's more H pluses or more H3O pluses, okay, in the solutions in the aqueous uh, water environment we just showed you. But to be an acid, somehow you produce H pluses in solution. And the only thing that's positive in solution is the H plus, okay? To be an Arrhenius base, well, we know that's going to increase the pH because the hydroxide concentration increases and the only thing negative in solution is the hydroxide ion. And it's just that simple. To be an Arrhenius acid, you have to somehow have a proton in your molecule so that in solution, that's the proton that's positive. If you're Arrhenius base, you have to have a hydroxide in your molecule so that that's what dissociates into solution. So let's go, look, go to a table that shows us all of our acids and bases. 99% of the time, if you've got an acid in your problem and you need to identify it, it's going to be listed in table K. So here are acids and here are the names they give you. Notice the H in front. The H is there to show you that, hey, it will dissociate into an H+. Now, the definition of Arrhenius is that, hey, it's going to make H pluses in solution. It's not about it dissociating, but you can get that point. So look at the H's in front. The H's are showing you that they're given off. Okay, now of course, ethanoic acid or acetic has the H in front as this molecular formula, but the Ku group, 
which you know is an organic acid from table R, is also an acid, and you won't see the H in front because they're showing the structural formula. If you write it this way, it does. That's why in table E, they write it both ways. Here is the molecular formula. Here is the structural formula. Okay, and then a car carbonic acid, H2. Now, to be an Arrhenius base, you have to ha be a salt. Now, a salt is a metal to non-metal, I'm sorry, a metal, uh, a salt, I should say, really, is a positive and negative ion attracting each other. The hydroxide ion is a polyatomic ion, a cluster of nonmetals that need an electron from its environment, and it's negative, and it attracts the positive. And in water, this dissociates completely. Now, so NaOH, KOH, and calcium OH are all bases. Okay, these are Arrhenius bases. If you notice, ammonia does not have, and you have to know ammonia by name, does not have a hydroxide. So this one is not an Arrhenius acid. You'd see there's no hydroxide to dissociate. Now, before I continue my discussion, okay, some people like to confuse things that are organic with an OH. Just because you see an OH in a compound doesn't make it a base. For instance, if I have ethanol, which is an alcohol, and I have something called a hydroxyl group. This is not, okay, going to dissociate into ions. This is covalently bonded, and covalently bonded things do not dissociate into ions unless they are acids. So alcohols listed in table R are not bases, not bases. So anytime you see questions trying to find a base, the reagents loves to throw alcohols. Okay, and as we've learned in an organic unit, these are not bases. They're covalently bonded. So really, an Arrhenius base is an ionic compound. Notice metal to what? Negative ion or nonmetals, whereas ethanol is nonmetal to nonmetal. That's covalently bonded. It's not going to break apart into ions. Bases or I should say alcohols are not bases because they're not electrolytes. They do not break apart into ions, specifically hydroxide ions. So be careful of a group of nonmetals. So if you see, hey, C3, H7, OH, whoa, the OH, oh, carbon, hydrocarbon chain, that's an alcohol. Remember, table R shows ROH. This R is the rest of an organic molecule, all right? So essentially, acids and bases are electrolytes. But back to this, ammonia is not an Arrhenius base because it doesn't have a hydroxide in it, yet somehow it changes the hydroxide formula. So Arrhenius, its easiest definition, okay? It's the smallest definition of acids and bases. Why is it the smallest? Because it only took and explained only a small sector of acid and bases, the most easiest of all definitions. So if it pops up, just think of, hey, what makes an acid? Oh, H pluses. What makes a base? Oh, hydroxide's in the compound. So you just, it's the easiest one to remember. Now, there's two other definitions. They don't name them, okay? They call it other, okay? But we're going to stick with just one. And Bronston-Lowry was a more encompassing definition, the Bronston-Lowry definition, which they do not name by name in this course in Regents Chemistry. They name it just the other, okay, other definitions. So there were some acids and bases that essentially made the pH go up if it's a base, down if it's an acid, yet they did not fit the Arrhenius definition. I mean, I'm sorry, they didn't fall under the same basic or acidic definitions that Arrhenius had. So what was it? Well, the other definition to be an acid is that you are a H plus donor. Okay, to be a base, you're a H plus acceptor. Okay, and uh, I kind of alluded to this in up here. How did one water become H3O plus and one become hydroxide? Well, because this front water must have accepted a proton. And the one that accepted a proton was acting as a base. And the one that was donating is an acid. And they may say, well, how can I memorize, 
memorize this? Well, you could memorize it, but you can understand what do acids do? HCl, doesn't HCl break apart into H plus? Okay, and Cl negative? It gives off H pluses. So the acids give off H pluses, which means they donate them. That's why this is the acid. Now, myself, Mr. Gratsky, I thought the bases are hydroxides. They are. But what hydroxides actually do with their lone pairs is they can accept things that are H pluses. And you know an H plus by hydroxide makes water. It's called a neutralization reaction. They can accept an H plus. The reason why this is a nice base and it can neutralize an acid, it can accept an H plus and take away the acidic properties by making water. Okay, so that's how that works. So let's go back to NH3 because they listed in your table that NH3 is a base. Well, why? Well, when you drop it in water, watch what it does. Okay, what it does is the lone pair in the nitrogen can accept and attract and take away an H off of water. And by water donating it, it's acting as an acid, according to the definition. And NH3 is acting as a base by accepting. And what happens is this makes the ammonium ion listed in table E. And what's left over after water gives up its H is the hydroxide. And if they were to ask you, and oh, by the way, and by doing all of that, you indirectly have produced hydroxides. So even though ammonia doesn't have a hydroxide, it, it, it indirectly gave off hydroxides. So my friends in chemistry, let's look at it this way. They could give you this reaction in a regions and say, who are my acids and bases? And here's what I do. I look at this as the current scenario. I look at this as the future. Yes, the future. So in the future, NH3 becomes NH4+. Well, how did that happen? It has one more H. How did that happen? Well, because it must have accepted an H+, which means that H+, must have donated it. So the one who donates is the acid. The one who accepts is the base. Now, if you're an acid on one side, you're going to be a base at the end. It's called a conjugate acid-base pair. Conjugate acid-base pair, not part of the course. But if you don't like that, go in reverse. If I go left to right, I mean uh, right to left, go in the opposite, hydroxide becomes H2O. How'd that happen? It has one more H in the future. It must have accepted an H. And by doing so, it acts as a base, which we know hydroxides are bases anyway. And this guy donated an H+, so it's an acid. Notice, if it's a base on one side, what's left over is the acid. And you're responsible for figuring out who the acid and base are by figuring out who donated the proton and who accepted. Okay, we'll do one more. All right, let's do another one. Let's do... Um, let's do Na, let's do this, CO3, negative 2, plus water, makes a hydroxide, Okay, if you want to pause it and figure out who my acid and bases are, you can do that. Okay, if you didn't pause it, just waiting for me to do the answer, sure. CO3 negative 2, the carbo uh, carbonate ion listed in table E, becomes HCO3 negative, the hydrogen carbonate ion. Notice it was negative 2, now it's negative 1. How'd that happen? It must have gained an H. In the current scenario, it has no H. In the future, it has one more. So it must have, guess what? absorbed an H. This is a base accepting a proton. And the water has one less, so it must have donated, so it's the acid. What was the base is now the acid on the other side, acid base. If you don't see that, what happened when you go left to right? Well, this has less H's, so this must have donated an H+, which makes it an acid. It's just that simple. 
Now, one core uh, piece of information that pops up over and over again in this course is an electrolyte. Electrolytes are nothing more than substances that break apart into free, it's important, free mobile, which is the same thing, I guess, ions. Ions that move conduct electricity. How? Very, sim very simple, even though my drawing just got real complex. Okay, watch. If I've got a solution, and let's say I have something that's negatively charged, like, a, like an open end of a wire. If I've got positive and negative ions equally interdispersed as a homogeneous solution, okay, watch what happens, party people. If I have something giving off negative charge, an open end of a wire, okay, in my solution, I guess I didn't draw the top of my solution, okay, all right, a little wavy. And if this is negatively charged, clearly the positives are all going to migrate, okay, to this side. Now, what's that? What's it going to leave me? It's going to leave me with a container where all the positive ions are on one side, and all the negatives, which are repelled by that charge, are on the other. And what was a neutral solution? now is negative on this side. So it was negative on this side, and by the movement of ions, we created a conduction of charge. And that's how it works. So the ions have to be free. And you learned way back in bonding, things that are ionic are made of ions, like sodium chloride. They're soluble. They break apart into Na plus and Cl negative. And you learned, Okay, it's important to see these units as not just individual units, as ones that blend into each other, that this guy does not dissolve electricity when it's solid. Ionic compounds are solid because of the strong attraction between ions and make regular repeating attractions. But here, that these ions can't move. Therefore, solid ionic compounds do not conduct. But if you heat them, okay, and make NaCl go into a what? Liquid phase, this ionic compound will have free ions called molten state, as you would use an electrolytic cell for a few salt. Now, also, if you take NaCl and dissolve it in water, you'll get the free ions. So um, ionic compounds conduct electricity when you melt the solid or dissolve the solid but never as the solid. So who are electrolytes? Well, just as I just said, number one, ionic compounds, which are fancy words for salts, metal, nonmetals. Who else? Well, of course, acids. Acids dissociate into protons or produce H3O pluses. And of course, you guessed it, bases dissociate into hydroxides or produce hydroxides indirectly by absorbing an H plus off of water, like a other definition. So the things that are electrolytes are ionic compounds or salts, acids, and bases. Those are your three things. And the ones that conduct the best have the higher concentration of ions. So if I've got a four molar solution of a, of a strong base, and a six molar solution of a strong base, the one with the greater uh, concentration or the one with the greatest number of ions is the better conductor. So now we're up to the last piece of this unit. It's called neutralization. It's the idea if I take a proton from an acid, which under high enough concentrations is very dangerous, and I take a hydroxide from a base, under high enough concentrations, it's also very dangerous. High concentration hydroxides are what's in liquid Drano. And if they can dissolve uh, clogs and pipes, you know that these are caustic and very dangerous scenarios. H pluses can corrode metals. So individually, under high enough concentrations, these are very dangerous. So you could neutralize the danger of an H plus or hydroxide by taking all of the extra H plus in solution and matching them up with hydroxides to make water. Neutralization, very simply, is taking the proton from an acid, hydroxide from a base, to make 
water and taking the danger away. So really neutralization is where the moles, the amount of H pluses, or again H3O pluses, I keep saying they're synonymous, equal the moles of the hydroxide. Now in neutralization reactions, okay, we're going to see an acid. Let's put, let's hydrobromic acid and let's put sodium hydroxide. These are acids and bases. Arrhenius acid and Arrhenius base. Now what's going to happen? You need to know that and identify a neutralization reaction as an acid and base, but this looks a lot like something called double replacement reactions. If you take your HBr, there's an H in front, uh, H is plus, bromide's negative, Na is plus, hydroxide's negative. And what's going to happen is they're going to switch partners. The H plus is going to find the OH minus when you pour them to, e to each other, and the sodium's going to find the Br. And we're going to double replace. And we're going to make NaBr, and we're going to make HOH. And all I did was take the H plus and the OH minus and the Na plus and Br minus and we double replace. These are really double replacement reactions. And very importantly, acid and base reactions always give me an acid plus a base makes a salt, which we should know as the ionic compound, and water. Now you could write water H2O. I kept it that way and certainly you could write it that way. It's totally fine to show that that's how it came together. Now, of course, when you write the reactions, you shouldn't have the charges. So an acid and base makes a salt in water, but really it's double replacement. And you're expected to be able to uh, find the products of these and identify. Now, you should also know that the, the, um, the bottom line here, if I take an H plus and negative Na plus OH minus, I'm just putting the charges back here. All right. What's happening is really an H plus from the acid plus the OH from the base makes water. That's the bottom line. What I just got out, I crossed off something called the spectator ions. Okay. So this is the bottom line in neutralization. So sometimes we'll say, which of the following is neutralization? You can look at an acid-base reaction, like I just did here. Okay. Na, uh, oops, uh, Br, which was right here. And this was HBr. And this was uh, NaOH. So you can look at a um, full reaction, or they can just show you the net ion reaction, canceling out all those spectators that really won't have any effect on the overall process. Okay, so be careful of that. Now, you should be able to write these as a double replacement. Now, the other part to neutralization are, is the math. You know, I could have a four molar solution of, let's say, NaOH. And I could say, well, how many, what, what molar solution of HCl would I need to exactly neutralize that? Well, let's pretend it's 100 milliliters. And you could say, well, uh, if I have 100 milliliters of my acid, what would it be its concentration if it exactly neutralized it? And you would say four. Okay. Now, why does that work? Because we're trying to match what? Moles of H pluses to moles of hydroxide. Let me give you an example, okay? Let's just say I have 100 milliliters of a 2 molar solution of hydrochloric acid, all right? And I want to know from this how many moles of NaOH do I need to neutralize? The acid. Well, the first thing I'm going to do is find how many moles of this. Molarity from table T is moles of solute over a liter of solution. So this has to go to a liter. So molarity is 2m. I'm going to put that right here in its place. That's right, so I got that right here. 100 milliliters, and I should know converting, and this is a region's question, 100 milliliters 
to go to liters. I know some of you guys can do this in your head. Okay, so one liter is equal to a thousand milliliters. Smaller unit, bigger number. Bigger unit, smaller number. That's how I remember one and who's a thousand. Divide by a thousand, I get 0 0.100 liters. Okay. And I'm going to solve for moles. So 0.1 times 2, and what I get here is 0.2 moles of HCl, which is really an acid, H pluses. Well, guess what? How many moles of hydroxide do I need? Guess what? 0.2 moles, because this is a base. That's simple. Now, of course, they can get a little bit trickier here. Okay? What if the base, what if the acid... Well, let's do it this way. What if the base was not uh, C, uh, NaOH, it was calcium hydroxide? I've got to be careful here. Well, if I need, if I have calcium hydroxide, I'm producing twice as much, right? So I know in the same problem, I have 2, 0.2 moles of H pluses. It still has to be neutralized. I still need 0.2 moles of hydroxide. But because this base produces twice as much hydroxide as NaOH or the H plus, the 2 to 1 ratio, I need half as much. So the answer here would be 0.1. So when you do these problems, they're not hard, but you've got to pay particular care if your acid and base is not a 1 to 1. This wasn't 1H to 1N, 1 hydroxide, I should say. Now it's not. It's not a 1 to 1, and you have to be aware of that. Most of the time, 95% of the time, it's a 1 to 1 scenario. Now we have the last little piece and it's mole, it's called titration problem. Let me explain how that problem works. Okay, so titration is a laboratory technique and it's a volumetric titration. There's many types where we're going to use a known amount of something standard. Standard means it was standardized by some other method to know definitely what its concentration is. So I'm going to use a base. And what I'm going to do is figure out the concentration of an unknown acid by using something I definitely know how much base I need to add and how much concentration it actually is. I'm using the idea that my H pluses equal my hydroxides. I'm going to add enough base to this acid till I get to this point called the end point. Now the end point is the point where it equal each other and we're going to denote that change through an indicator. Okay, from table M. Now, we'll talk about those indicators last, but let's talk about the process. So, I'm trying to figure out this concentration. Let's just pretend I add, now I have 40 milliliters in my, my acid here. And I'm adding enough base to neutralize that when these things equal each other and the pH will be 7. So, I'm adding a base to an acid and the pH is rising, right? pH is rising because I'm adding something with a high pH to a low pH. So I'm rising it up to 7. So it's going from a low pH here to a 7 when these equal each other. Now, my friends in chemistry, I know when this happens, okay? I know when this happens, I'm going to stop this and there's going to be indicator color change. And that's going to tell me I've reached the end point. And if you did this in lab, it's that slight pink color if you used phenolphthalein. But you're trying to do this. So let's pretend I needed to add 40 milliliters of NaOH to my acid. Well, if I needed just 40 milliliters and my acid is 40 milliliters, doesn't it make sense that my concentration of my acid is 2 molar? Because if I need the same amount of NaOH as my HCl, base to acid, it has to be the same concentration. Now, of course, that's not what I'm going to do to you. But we use a nice, nice formula here. Yeah, it's nice, nice. And it's the titration formula given to you in table T. Let's go there for a second. So titration, M, molarity of the acid, volume of the acid equals molarity of the base, volume of the base. Tells you right there. So titration problems, a classic question you'll definitely see, probably, definitely, probably, <laughs> on your part two sections. One, the, there's a math question on your test. It's going to be usually this one. So I write the acid on top here, and the base over here. If you want to use AA, you can. 
Now, why does this work nicely? Again, titration is about equal each other. Molarity, from table T also, is moles over liter. And if this is a liter, and this is moles over liter, and this is a liter, look what it does, party people. Liters cancel out. And look what equals. Moles of acid, which is H plus, is equals moles of base. That's why this formula works. Okay? So here's what you do. You take your base concentration. That's the standard. Now, sometimes they can switch this. So the molarity of your base is 2 molar. The molarity of the acid, we don't know. We know its concentration is 40 milliliters. And it doesn't have to be in it. This formula is a ratio question, so you really don't have to have it in liters. If it was a molarity problem, moles over liters, you'd have to have it. So you can keep that in 40 milliliters. Now, if you notice, we have two unknowns. We need to measure, okay, by our laboratory procedure, how much of the base we actually add until we get that slight pink color if we're using phenolphthalein. So we'd keep adding this, and we would measure initial and a final volume. So sometimes in your questions, you'll see readings from this burette, which is what we use in a titration. And it's an emptying device, so it starts at 0, 0.00 milliliters, and you measure how much is emptied. So you might have to subtract if your initial concentration, or your initial volume, I should say, is here. You'd have to subtract. So let's pretend that this is 12.37 milliliters. Okay, and let's say it went down to uh, 22.37 milliliters. So you'd have to subtract those two points, and what you would get from that subtraction is 10 milliliters, or 10.00 milliliters. Important you understand that. And then you just do your math. 2 times 10 is 20. 20 divided by 40, and I'm just doing algebra. This times this, divide by that number, is equal to my x. And what I'm going to get, all right, I'm going to get 0 0.50 molar. Now, does that make sense to you? Think about this for a second. All right, think with me. If I needed only 10 milliliters to neutralize this acid that was 40 milliliters, wow, isn't this a fourth of my volume? So I needed a fourth of that volume. Shouldn't this be four times as concentrated? And 2m is four times concentrated than 0.5. And that's how it works. Okay, so 0.5 is your value. Now, when you do these types of uh, problems, be, pay particular attention, okay, to the type of acid. In this problem, I used hydrochloric acid, and I used NaOH, as I alluded to before, and it's my favorite word today. Okay, this was a one to one ratio type of acid problem. If I was to use a acid, let's say the acid was sulfuric H2SO4. There's two H's here. I could not just answer this by itself. I'm assuming it's one to one here, moles of acid. What we do is you bring this two down into the equation and then solve for it. Likewise, if I had a base that had a 2 at the end, like a calcium hydroxide, the 2 would go on the same side and then, and then solve. Just pay it particular attention. So if this was sulfuric acid, okay, and I have twice as much H's than expected, all right, then we would probably need what? Okay, a heck of a lot more base to do that. So that's how that would work. So if you were to solve for this, okay, this 2 would go to the bottom here, right? And it'd be 20 divided by 80, okay? And that would give you the 0.25 molar. And you can see that the answer is cut in half, okay, because there's twice as much H as here. Because it doesn't have to be as concentrated um, as 0.5 molar, for 10 milliliters to neutralize it because there's twice as much H's, right? So if it was a one-to-one, -one, like we had it previously, it'd be 0.5 molar. Because there's twice as much H's, then the concentration is going to be half as much to produce the same amount of H pluses 
that'll equal the hydroxides on this side. Okay, so anytime you have an unequal number, put that number on the same side. Okay, and then solve for it normally. This happens very rarely, but does pop up in some small occasions in this course. Okay, last bit is table M. Okay, table M of common acid-base indicators are really weak acid-base pairs that change according to pH, their, their, um, their uh, physicality or the three-dimensional shape changes with different pHs so that they absorb different parts of the wavelengths of light and give off colors. However, all you have to know to read this chart is to know that, hey, if I'm dealing with phenolphthalein, anything basically 8 and lower, okay, or anything less than 8 is colorless, I should say, and anything 9 and above is pink. We were looking for something that was slightly pink, just about uh, 8 and that was good enough for our endpoint. So if they ever ask you what color something is, so if I was in a basic pH, 7 and above, I know that litmus is blue, because um, if I'm basic enough, usually basic's above 7, so if it's uh, 8.3 and above, it's blue. Uh, so in that case, not a great example, but brown crystal green, if I knew I had a basic pH, anything over 7 would be blue in this case, because it turns blue at 5.4. Okay, if I said I had a real acidic solution with bromothymol blue, okay, if it's below 6, it's going to be yellow. So these are the types of things, and they're very easy to read, but just remember, break this down the line. This goes that way, and that's for the colors that go that way. So I think red, yellow, and yellow for anything 4.5 or 3.8 or 8.8 .8 and lower. Now they could say which would be a, a better indicator for a different pH change. You know, if I have a pH change that's occurring in a very acidic solution, methyl orange. In a basic solution, thymol blue. Okay, and sometimes it can give you questions where you're trying to narrow down the pH. We did a lab with that, uh, and they could give you, hey, if methyl orange is yellow, okay, 4.4 higher. Bromothymol blue is yellow. Okay, well, that's 6.0 and lower. So I know my pH is between 4.4 and 6.0, right? I'll say that again. If I have a, a solution, tested with methyl orange and it goes yellow, I know it's 4.4 or higher. And if I use the same solution and test it with bromothymol blue, if it goes yellow, it's 6.0 or lower. So that pH is 4.4 to 6, and then I would have, they could, say, they could tell me in a part two, give me the pH for that. And you would say, okay, any number between 4.4 and 6, 5, 4.6, okay, 5.8, something along those lines. And that's essentially, okay, the acid and base unit. Hope you enjoyed it.